Hello, my name is Aoife and I'm from the Children Disability Network team and you're very welcome to this presentation today um, where we will be talking about um, toilet training. Um, so I'm going to be covering various different areas in toilet training and um, I suppose you know you'll always have the option to kind of stop and rewind if there's areas that you want to clarify. Um, so we'll, we're as well to get started. So when looking at preparation for toilet training and things that we're going to talk about today is how the bladder and the bowel work, the stages of development and bladder and bowel control, the skills required for toileting, the influence of emotions, issues to consider for toilet training, health and diet, signs of readiness, toileting equipment, communication and toilet record chart. There's other areas that we've actually added to this presentation. So there's a lot that we're covering um, today. So I suppose one of the things that we need to start off with really is, is what toilet tra training means. And it means, I think for parents, sometimes it's often forgotten that it's about being patient, being persistent and being positive. And sometimes that's often the most challenging piece because toilet training can be extremely challenging for some children. Um, so if we're looking at how the bladder and the bowel work, so if we look first of all at the bladder, um, the bladder stretches, we get the sensation of fullness, the muscles tighten to hold on, we move to the toilet, the bladder contracts, the sphincter relaxes, and you have the release of urine. So although this is something that we, you or I do, um, very regularly throughout the day, we don't really consider that what's happened when we go to the toilet to do a wee. Whereas when we go and open our bowels, the rectum stretches, we get the sensation of fullness, the muscles tighten to hold on, we move to the toilet, the rectum contracts, abdomen and diaphragm contract to push down, the sphincter relaxes and you release a faeces or having a poo. Um, now the one thing I would say is you know, as I said just a few minutes, a few seconds ago, we go to the toilet quite regularly. And this is something that, you know, if you can think back to the last time you went to the toilet, did you consider that it was cold, that it was warm, there may not have been loo roll, there may not have been various different things. Um, and it may be the fact that you just went to the toilet and um, once you were done, you were done. You, you didn't pay much attention to it. However, there's so much actually that goes on that for children, um, there's so many steps that they need to consider. So it's not as straightforward as you may think. It's not a step of they sit in the toilet, they do we, and then it's done. Um, there's a lot more to consider. So if we look at, I suppose, development of the bladder and the bowel. So the stage one is um, when there's no conscious control of the bladder and bowel and they have frequent urinations. Um, then we have stage two, which is the conscious of the bladder tension, and you may hold on to urine briefly. Um, and it, that's kind of the starting of beginning to indicate of an awareness of being wet or dry. So that might be where you see your um, child maybe tapping on their nappy or that kind of indication where they they know that there's something uncomfortable. Um, stage three is the kind of larger bladder capacity, so less frequent urinations. Gradually develops ability to voluntarily hold on to the urine and bowel movements. This requires tightening of the muscles, beginning to indicate a need to go. So that might be where you're seeing your child at various different times that you know they're only oh, about to do a poo when they're napping. Then stage four is the gradually develops the ability to voluntarily release your inner bowel movements. This requires relaxation of the muscles, able to hold on for longer periods. General bowel control develops before bladder control. Stage five develops the ability to voluntarily release your urine from partially full bladder. And then stage six is nighttime control. Um, so if we're looking at, I suppose, the other skills for toileting, we're looking at motor skills. So the ability to um, get up onto the toilet, postural control, the ability to sit um, and to be, you know, feel supported while they're sitting on the toilet, attention span so that they're able to have the attention to sit on the toilet um, and to engage in the activity that um, they're doing. Um, language skills that they're able to understand and able to say you know all done or able to indicate that that they're finished and social skills so that they can pick up on your social cues and um, I suppose the one thing we would say is is that 
you may already know that your child does not have you know is struggling with these skills or is just gaining um, some skills over the other and it may be the fact that they're strong in their postural control but their language skills and their social skills are one area that you're trying to work on at the moment and look it's not to say that um these are just skills that you know people need to a degree for toilet training but it's not essential like it may be the fact that the language skills that you're using visuals or you're using a social story um, and that we just need to be conscious of those areas that it may be a bit more difficult. So we put in a bit more work around that to support your child. So I suppose the one thing what we would look at is um, when you're thinking about starting toilet training, um, the one thing you need to start is the first step is really modeling the behavior. So modeling the behavior is all about um, you sitting on the toilet and your child observing you sitting on the toilet. Um, so this is a really big step that the child because often the bathroom and the toilet is a room that a child is not allowed access or uh, use on a regular basis because it's a very um you know we're very conscious of the environment there's a toilet there we don't want the child to fall into the toilet so often they're very much only going to the toilet on a rare occasion the toilet and the bathroom is a very different room to everywhere else in the house it's often colder it's cleaner um just it may have the fact that there's um, a, a different smell in the bathroom. So we need to get them very much familiar with it. In terms of modeling, the one thing I would say is dads need to be conscious um, because the one thing about it is if your dads are standing up to do a wee, your child will automatically realize that that's what they need to do. And obviously mum sits down to do a wee, so just being conscious of that because I know in some children I've come across who are well able to stand up to do a wee but, um, and are independent with that, but they never got used to sitting down and really struggle to sit down to do a number two. So the one thing I would start try and, and focus mainly on is modelling the behaviour that everybody's sitting down. Um, the other thing is, is that I suppose once with your child, it may be um, a good, it's a good idea to change your child in the toilet area, so they get familiar that the that the um, when they've done a number one or a number two, uh, and you empty the contents of the nappy into the toilet. So change them in the bathroom area, and you empty the contents of the wee or the poo into the toilet, because probably at the moment they see that the nappy goes in the bin, and that's their understanding of toileting. So um, even if it is the fact that there's not, obviously we has been soaked up into the nappy, but the action of it, of emptying the contents, and it may be the fact that you might have a small bit of toilet paper there, and you say, okay, we throw that in as well. But even just the action of, of showing the child that, oh, I'm putting something in the toilet, and then we flush it. And then I suppose the next step is sitting on the toilet, which we'll discuss um, in a bit more detail. So the one thing is, is really having the first two steps is essential. The second, the third step, um, once your child is a lot more familiar with that bathroom space, and if you're in a lucky situation where your bath or your shower is in that bathroom space, and your child, you know, once a week or twice a week has a bath, what I would do is, is that I would um, give your child, uh, after they have the bath, wrap them up in a towel and put the lid of the toilet down and sit them on the toilet. So the lid is down, like the picture here, and your child is sitting on the toilet. But they're sitting on the toilet while you're supporting them and you're wiping them down and you're drying them. And it may be 10 seconds, it may be five seconds, but they're actually sitting on the toilet. They may not be actually engaging in a toileting activity of, of you know, doing a wee or poo, but we, the whole thing about it is getting them to sit on the toilet. Um, and I would be doing that regularly. You may need to increase the amount of baths that they're having so that they get more familiar. And the other thing is, is that you need to have supportive equipment in there. So having a step so that they feel a bit supported to put their feet onto. But it might be just the phase where you just dry them while they're sitting on that toilet. And then you lift them off and change them in a different room. But it's actually that whole piece of them physically sitting on the toilet. And if you feel that that's too much of a step, what you can do is you sit on the toilet with the lid down, put your child on your knee and dry them that way. So that would be a, a starting piece. Um, so if we look at really the steps of independent toileting, we have going to the toilet. Um, going to the toilet bathroom, these are kind of the first section of steps. Recognising when to go, waiting to eliminate, entering the toilet or the bathroom. So they're, you know, really about going to the toilet and to the bathroom space. Then we have about independence in the bathroom. So in terms of independence in the bathroom, it's 
pulling the pants down, sitting on the toilet, eliminating the toilet, using the toilet paper, pulling pants back up, flushing the toilet, washing hands and drying hands. These are all the steps required for toileting. So I often feel like this is really one of the most important slides in this presentation. And I encourage parents to often take this one off, take this slide off and put it on the fridge um, at home because there's an awful lot on this and it just shows that toilet training is going to take a significant amount of time and we need to maybe focus on one or two skills at a given time. So if you're thinking of your child, what I the first thing I would do is have a look over these and look at potentially the bottom of list two and work your way up. So are they able to dry their hands? Are they able to wash their hands? You know, think about flushing the toilet. Now that might be the things that you're thinking, do you know what? We need to work on those first. We need to work on pulling pants back up using toilet paper. So I'll give you some ideas on activities that you can think of because although you're engaging in toilet training, you're looking at potentially modeling, so their child coming in and watching you go into the toilet, and all the other skills like pulling pants back up, flushing the toilet, washing hands, they might be your goals for the next six months. And that's fantastic because that's getting you on the step to getting to working on toilet training. Um, we often find that recognizing when to go, wait to eliminate, um, are one of those ones that are often the, the last steps in toilet training. And some of your children might be flying with all of these and it's only one step that they have to focus on so things like if it is that you really want to work on um in terms of your child you know um cleaning themselves after the toilet if that's another skill that you really want to um, focus on the one thing you can do is look at activities like using a, um, a j-clock to clean the table that's a really good one um, to work on, or if it is to clean the windows. So that's all around the area of wiping. Um, and just practicing things like washing hands and drying hands. Um, those things are quite, you know, are, are, are quite good activities to get your child to, to learn those skills. And see here, like one of them is using the toilet paper. So if it is the fact of getting your child familiar with the sensation of um toilet paper on their skin and that could be if your child has um you know if you're cleaning their hands or drying their hands that you do it with toilet paper it may not be the same area that they're going to be using the toilet paper when they're cleaning you know their bottom themselves but they need to get used to the sensation and it's very different to wipes if, or cotton wool if that's what you're using at the moment um so i suppose one of the things is we need to talk about your child's readiness checklist so i have the checklist here and what i'll do is i'll read out the questions and you need to think for yourself and maybe make a note of the areas that you think actually my child needs a bit more support of this and i have to say you know an awful lot of parents with children who have disabilities will also always flag with us that um when we do this checklist that they're like there's only one or two that they're managing and that's fine but we just need to alter the time training to make it fit for your child and to make it holistic for them and their needs. So it may be the fact that we just need to focus on one skill area for a period of time. So I'll call them out and just make a note yourself. Is my child healthy with no medical conditions or medication that could affect bladder or bowel control or function? Does my child have regular predictable bowel habits? Does my child release a reasonable amount of urine at one go? Are there two to three hour periods of dryness between nappy changes during the daytime? Does my child indicate when he or she is wet or dry? Does my child show an awareness of when he or she is doing a bowel or bladder um, action? Does my child maintain an independent sitting position? Does my child move independently with or without a mobility aid? Does my child help with dressing and hand washing routines? Does my child show an interest in the toilet? Does my child follow a simple instruction? Does my child indicate, indicate needs using signs or gestures? Does my child respond or understand rewards and or praise? 
And now we move on to the parent readiness checklist. So I suppose the one thing is, is it's very interesting to look at your child's readiness, but it's also considered yourself and the other members of the house, you know, and your partner in terms of having them on board with doing toilet training. So is this the right time to start toilet training? Warm weather, minimal behaviour issues occurring, no major events such as a new baby, moving house, family holiday or family illness. Do I have the time to commit to toilet training? Do I have the support of my child's other care providers? Do I have the equipment I need? Training pants or nappies, loose clothing for easily removal, toilet equipment, reward options and communication aids. So there are things to consider as a parent readiness. And as I flagged earlier, if you're finding in terms of there's certain areas that are flagged to you for your child readiness and parent readiness that are impacting on your ability to start toilet training, it might be an idea to think, okay, let me go back and focus on the skills that we could work on. Let's focus on flushing the toilet, washing hands. Let's focus on pulling up and down the trousers. And let's try and address those as a starting point to see how we get on over the next three to six months um, with those skills and those areas. So there's also, an, I suppose, a quick note about diet and drinks. Just bear with me now till I get on to my... So I suppose if we think in terms of meal planning and in terms of our, our children and, and the fact that toilet training and considering how they eat and, and their diet, you know, in terms, of, I suppose, grazing and sipping foods, milk versus water or juices and kind of getting an idea of, of, of children's intake. So I suppose constant nibbling or grazing um, or taking small amounts of food or drinks frequently throughout the day influence the readiness to toilet train. The digestive system is designed so that we eat when hungry, drink in volumes that allows us to leave gaps in between. The bowel is stimulated when the stomach stretches. If the stomach doesn't stretch because the amounts are not enough, to stretch it, then there is no signal to the bowel. For children who need routines and prompts to start toilet training, these signals are the ideal time to head to the toilet or the potty and are more likely to promote success. Prompts to toilet can always be faded out when a routine is established and children become more independent in knowing the signals or feelings that mean they need to go. Similarly, sipping small amounts of drink doesn't stretch the bladder. It just kind of irritates it. And again, the sign for full bladder will not happen often enough to be reinforced in a successful toileting program. Children who are tube fed have been able to be toilet trained when the routines are established and adhered to. Milk is treated by the digestive system as food and some water in it. Children who drink large amounts of milk generally have poor appetites for food, low fibre intake, low iron intake, and tend to get constipated very easily. Water is the best fluid for children, but small amounts of sugar-free flavouring can be added to ensure good amounts are taken. Good to know your poo, and it's good to know in terms of constipation, is not defined by how often you go, but the consistencies and the behaviours around it. So I suppose we've got here on the pre on the presentation in terms of the age and the amount of fluid intake that should be taken. Um, we also look at, I suppose, the, the, you know, calculating the kind of the sugar intake or the, the fluid intake, sorry, for um, children in terms of their, um, their weight. And it's also that I suppose the thing is, is that no more than, if your child has poor fluid intake, it is going to impact on, on the fact of toilet training. So this gives us the water content of various different foods. Um, and I suppose a very diet plus taking drinks, um, you know, it, it, it enables us to get a better accuracy and it helps in terms of toilet training. So this may be an area that you feel, actually, I need to work on this as a starting point with my, with my child and get them into a bit more of a balanced diet or increasing their fluid intake. Um, you know, um, 
And I think it's just important to try and kind of consider that because sometimes we don't even think of these things when we're starting into toilet training. Um, I suppose the one thing we flagged there is knowing your poo. Um, it's important to, your, you know, children's um, nappies and their poo consistency can change on a regular basis. So having a bit more of an idea if you're finding that your child's poo is at a certain level at a certain time. So just being aware in terms of the rabbit droppings, being aware as if it's the consistency of, of a corn in the cob, because that may be able to determine in terms of their diet, what they're eating and how we may need to kind of adjust or adapt. Um, you know, and it does help. And I suppose the next um, photo here gives you an idea of a kind of a, uh, a birthday cake that was created. It's the Bis Bristol stool chart that we call in terms of the consistencies of um poo and it gives you an idea of what that consistency is because it does help for us to be able to predict in terms of a child's bowel habits being able to know if the fact of their they're really constipated and they're really struggling no more the other way if it is the fact that they are um struggling from the aspect that it's the consistency is just so poor that um they're having diarrhea regularly now, I suppose that we need to look at in terms of equipment. So we need to get an idea of the um, equipment that we need for toilet training. Now, first of all, I suppose I want to say is some parents go straight to the potty and that's perfectly fine. And they find that, that works really well. And it may be something you're doing at the moment. The hard thing is the potty can move around the house. So when you actually need the potty, it's not in the one location. You may have one upstairs, you may have one downstairs. But the other thing is your child can pick up the potty and move it or relocate it or put it in front of the t television and sit, um, what you call it, and sit in front of the television doing it. Um, okay, one second. So there are all the bits of equipment that we have. We say toilet seat, various different toilet seats, and different uh, different types of training seats to ensure it will fit accurately onto your toilet before you buy it. So just be conscious of that, in terms of um which types of seats we do need to have a, a step. Step is essential because that will help you to support your child. And then we have like here the ladder one, which um can be quite handy because it means that it's only one unit these are things to consider um so i suppose this is now we're coming to the end of um the first bit of our toilet training presentation so what we'll do is you'll get an, a second link to be able to access this so um what you call it so that you look this is just a short video on, on where we're at at the moment so i'll send that and um, you can now move on to the second link of the presentation thank you